안녕하세요. 허인식 원장입니다. Greetings, I'm Dr. h o i n s i k This is an online master course which summarizes offline master course. Today I'd like to talk about periimplantitis. I'm going to talk about three topics. First is about what periimplantitis is. I'm going to talk about the different types, cause, and classifications. Second is about diagnosis of implantitis. And I want to talk about treatments for implantitis. First is the types, cause, and classification of implantitis. First is peri-implant peri disease can be largely divided into two. First is peri-implant mucositis. Second is peri-implantitis. What is peri-implant peri mucositis? This is a reversible inflammation in the soft tissue that surrounds the implant. There is no bone loss. This refers to peri-implant mucositis. Second, what is peri-implantitis? The disease has progressed beyond the peri-implant mucositis and now there is surrounding bone loss. This situation is referred to as peri-implantitis. Around healthy implant, there is healthy attachments and there is no bleeding. However, if there is peri-implant mucositis, there is no alveolar bone resorption, but because of mucositis, there is bleeding and inflammatory exudates. Once peri-implantitis occurs, a bone is resorbed and gradually the disease progresses. What is the cause of peri-implantitis? There is a localized factor and general factor. What is localized factor? Lack of oral hygiene. Continuous food impaction can lead to it, and the periodontal condition is not good. Soft tissue condition is not good. There is no keratinized tissue, and it's not attached. These are most important factors, and implant placement depth is too shallow. This can also lead to peri-implantitis. If you place the implant too shallow, this can cause a peri-implantitis. Transmucosal part. The roughness of implant surface can also be the cause of peri-implantitis. Why are these potential causes? If it is rough, a plaque can accumulate, and the fit of superior prosthesis can be a factor. If the prosthesis and abutment do not fit well, it can be a problem, and there can be cement wash. These days, that's why there are many prosthetic options without the use of cement. Excess cement after bonding. This can be a serious cause of peri-implantitis. Let's look at general cause. The patient could have had history of severe periodontitis. There can be genetic factor as well. It can also be caused by acquired factors such as diabetes. Patient could have systemic disease as well. And there can be environmental factors. The patient may be smoking, or the patient may be extremely stressed, or may be drinking excessively. In these cases, because Management is difficult. Peri-implantitis can occur more easily. The biggest cause of peri-implantitis is biofilm. If there is a biofilm of bacteria on implant surface, it can cause inflammation and bone resorption. Control of biofilm is very important in managing peri-implantitis. 
Let's look at the classification of peri-implantitis following probing depths. In 2012, Stuart Forums introduced this classification if probing depths is over 4 millimeters and there's less than 25% of bone loss, it is classified as early peri-implantitis. If there's probing depths of over 6 millimeter and bone loss of 25 to 50%, it is moderate, and if it is beyond the 8 millimeters and if there's bone loss of 50%, it is classified as advanced peri-implantitis. This classification is not an absolute rule, but you can use this as a tool for communication. You can refer to it when you have conversations. How do we diagnose peri-implantitis? You can use different tools to do diagnosis of peri-implantitis. You can use block index, gingival index, bleeding on probing, probing depths, existence of separation and abscess, radiological evaluation, and Proximal surface evaluation can be done. We do not use all these tools. Most intuitively, we can check using the X ray image to see if peri implantitis is advancing. If you look at upper right quadrant around the implant, there is crater like a bone loss. If you look at CT in number 15, 16, and around number 17, implants, very serious crater-like bone loss can be observed. It's almost horizontal bone loss. This can be viewed as advanced peri-implantitis. Based on X-ray evaluation, we can check peri-implantitis. Next, upon probing, if there is irregular bleeding, we can diagnose it as peri-implantitis. Whether or not bleeding occurs is evaluated by probing the mesial side of the crown and then center, distal, buccal, and lingual side. Six aspects are reviewed. If possible, you need to apply light pressure. When you probe the sulcus, you need to apply light force. When we probe around the implant, if the probing depth is under 3 mm, then it can be considered a successful implant. This is the amount considering the mucosa thickness that has been healed. If the gingiva is thick or in the case of immediate implant placement, even if probing depth goes beyond 3 millimeters, it may not be peri-implantitis, so we should not trust this figure in an absolute manner. Increase in probing depths can be related to mucositis around the implant. From the point to where final implant prosthesis is completed, whether probing depths is increased or maintained can be more important. We need to look at the pattern. Rather than the absolute figure, we need to look at this. Upon probing, we need to prevent damage to the tissue and we need to prevent inflammation spreading to a healthy tissue. Therefore, light force needs to be applied. The peri-implant mucosa is loosely knit and this has already been mentioned. And if you apply the same amount of pressure as you would with natural tooth, then you would probe up to the alveolar bone, there is such possibility, and probing after removing the superior prosthesis would be more accurate. You need to check whether there is any abscess and separation around the implant, and you need to check the sulcus fluid around the implant. If this increases, we can make assumptions over peri-implantitis. Once the pressure is applied, we need to check whether there is exudate. This needs to be continuously checked. Another way to diagnose a peri-implantitis is to do proximal surface evaluation. 
We can do percussion test, electric percussion test, and RFA or resonance frequency analysis. In the case of a percussion test, you use the mirror, you use back of the dental mirror, it's not really credible. In the case of electric percussion test, you use dedicated tool to determine the level, and the most accurate is RFA. Finally, I want to talk about the treatment of peri-implantitis. The protocol that is most frequently mentioned is cyst protocol. This is also included in the specialist test. It is cumulative interceptive supportive therapy. It looks at the increased probing depths around the implant, signs of plaque, signs of bleeding upon probing, and the level of alveolar bone loss. Depending on the set symptoms, the treatment approach that we take differ. This is the classification suggested by Mubelli and Lang. This is the overview. If the probing depth is under 3 mm and a sign of plaque, signs of uh, bleeding upon probing, we need to determine whether we're going to observe or mechanical debridement is necessary. If the probing depth is to 4 to 5 millimeters, different treatment options can be chosen. In the case of advanced disease, if there is bone loss and a probing upon bleeding, surgical method and a different treatment options need to be preceded. Let's look at the different steps. Uh, Cyst protocol A involves mechanical cleaning. The probing depth is less than 3 millimeters and there is bleeding upon probing. The surface of the implant is cleaned using polishing agent rubber cup curette for implant treatment and smart scaler included in Ostem's IM Cure Kit. More important than anything else, we need to train patients of the importance of oral hygiene. Use of interdental brush, floss, super floss, and water pick is informed to the patient. We need to recommend it actively. After that, there is a system protocol involving laser treatment to clean and remove biofilm. We need to make sure that this is not directly applied to the implant. In the case of laser, it is applied in straight manner, so there may not be that many good indications. Among the protocol A, you irradiate plasma. Bacteria within the biofilm were sterilized by irradiating organic matter with plasma. You can effectively control biofilm using these devices. Uh, this is plasma device used at my dental clinic, as you can see. In the case of severe peri-implantitis, uh, you can add tip here if you apply energy. Biofilm around this are sterilized. Before applying plasma, it was like this. After applying plasma and having done a nice plaque control, you can see that the situation has improved with more healthy mucosa. Cyst protocol 2 is antiseptic therapy. Antiseptic is used for treatment. The probing disc is about 4 to 5 millimeter and there is bleeding upon probing. Mechanical Clinical debridement is done at the same time as well. Chlorohexidine irrigation is done frequently. This is done repeatedly for three to four weeks, and after a bit of a break period, this process is repeated. Cyst protocol C is antibiotic therapy. Antibiotics are used to kill the bacteria. The probing depth is over six millimeter, and there's bleeding upon probing. In general, cyst A and cyst B are also performed in combination. Systemic or local antibiotic therapy are used. Using systemic antibiotics for long-term for fundamental treatment of peri-implantitis is not really recommended, so I use local antibiotics such as periocline or minoclin more often.
Last is protocol D. It involves a surgical involvement after ablation. Implant surface is decontaminated or detoxificated. Flap is reflected and implant surface is exposed to chlorohexidin, citric acid, tetracycline, and minocline ointment are used to sterilize implant surface. Profiflex can be used, powder can be applied to clean the corrupted surface, but you need to be careful in this. If air goes into surrounding tissue, side effects can be caused, therefore precautions need to be made. After ablation, you can use an Ostem's smart brush or a smart scaler to clean implant surface. This is done frequently. You can use a high speed or low speed to make the rough implant surface smooth. You can do implantoplasty, I think. This is a very effective method based on my experience. I've done quite a few. It can stop the progression of peri-implantitis. Regenerative surgery are sometimes used. Biofilm or various contaminants around the implant are very rarely removed thoroughly. Hence, it frequently leads to failure. Decontamination of implant surface is the most important. In the case of regenerative treatment, the purpose of it is to preserve the contour of the defect. It serves as a filler rather than to achieve re integration. This is applied when there is at least two or three walls. This is a treatment procedure that can be applied to vertical or crater-like bone defect. What can we do at the very end? That is implant removal. Even if you have done cyst A to D, if symptoms continue to worsen and if the patient is requiring more fundamental treatment, there is no other way you have to remove the implant and replace it. If you look at this case, peri-implantitis has advanced significantly and a lot of bone resorption occurred. Three implants were removed. After healing period, implants were placed using guide. Final prosthesis was delivered and the patient is using the implants very well. Sister protocols A, B, C, D can be used to treat patients with peri-implantitis. Fundamentally, once peri-implantitis symptoms start to show, it is too late. We need to make sure that the peri-implantitis does not progress ahead of time, and we need to make sure such environment is provided. That is the best. Prevention is the best policy. For more specific details, please refer to Offline Master Course. I hope you get a lot of knowledge and experience through that. Thank you for watching.